my name is Angela Berger. If you haven't been to my channel before, I cover missing person cases and true crime cases. And today's story is the story of Margaret Ellen Fox, who went missing in 1974 under some very suspicious circumstances. Uh, so once you hear the details, you know, you do have to wonder if there may have been a serial killer in the area of New Jersey back in the 70s. So once you hear the story, let me know what you think. Margaret Ellen Fox lived in Burlington, New Jersey with her five brothers and her parents. Her dad was the town plumber and Margaret was a bit, was described as being a bit of a homebody. She enjoyed also riding horses and playing the piano. She did have some issues with bullies in school and having snowballs thrown at her. And in her diary, she wrote that someday she would like to, to move to California or Florida. She had just graduated from eighth grade at St. Paul's Catholic School. And it was now summertime. And Margaret was trying to think of a way to come up with some money um, so that she could have money to do some fun stuff during the summer. So Margaret and her cousin got together and were talking about how they could possibly make some money to do fun stuff in the summer. And they decided that babysitting would be a good choice. So they took out a classified ad in the local newspaper, the Burlington County Times, to advertise their babysitting services. And soon a man contacted them. He said his name was John Marshall. He was looking for a babysitter for his five-year-old son. He wanted someone to come to his house in Mount Holly, New Jersey. And at the house, he said he had a big yard with a swimming pool and a swing set. So he wanted a girl to come there to babysit uh, his son at his house. Margaret's cousin's parents decided they didn't want her to babysit for someone they didn't know. But Margaret's parents reluctantly allowed her to take the babysitting job. So John Marshall first called on June 19th, and he said that he would pay Margaret $40 to watch his son for four hours a day, five days a week during the summer. So she thought that was, you know, it sounds pretty good. So at first he said he wanted her to babysit for the first time on that Friday. But then shortly after that, he called back and said that his mother-in-law had just passed away um, so that he wouldn't need her to babysit on Friday. And then on Sunday, he again called back and said he wanted Margaret to babysit on that Monday. So they set it up. John said that he would meet her at the bus station in Mount Holly, New Jersey, and that he would pick her up in a red Volkswagen. Margaret's father, David, told her to call him when she arrived at this man's house so he would know that she got there safely. And then Joseph, who was Margaret's younger brother, who was 11 at the time, he walked Margaret to the bus stop, and he would be the last person in the family to ever see Margaret. When she didn't come back that night, and she also never called to report that she got to John Marshall's house, that time her parents called and reported her missing. Authorities interviewed the bus driver, people who had been on the bus, you know, the other passengers and nearby shop owners. One passenger remembered seeing Margaret get off the bus, but no one had seen her get into a red Volkswagen. And they did see her walking um, at the bus stop at Mill and High Streets, which was where um, John was supposed to meet her. So John Marshall hadn't given an address, but the family did have um, the phone number that he had called from. They were looking through notes that Margaret had taken and they found the phone number. The phone number that he had given was traced to a payphone in Mount Holly. A little bit strange. It was uh, close to a supermarket in Lumberton, New Jersey, which wasn't very far from Mount Holly. The supermarket's manager was actually named Jack Marshall. So the authorities went, they questioned this Jack Marshall, but Jack had no idea, you know, and he had an alibi. He was also able to pass a polygraph test 
and he was ruled out as a suspect. Four days after Margaret went missing, her family got a phone call and her mom answered. It was a man who said that he had kidnapped Margaret and that he would give her back if the family gave him $10,000. He said that $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Her mother then asked, who is this? And the man hung up. So in 2019, the FBI released a digital version of this recording, which I will play for you now. And you can hear this conversation between Margaret's mother and her possible kidnapper. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topping. Who is it? The next day, a note came with additional instructions. It said for the parents to put the $10,000 in blue box that was the same color blue as the blouse Margaret had been wearing when she went missing. The note said that Margaret's all right. We only tore her blouse and broke her glasses. A couple days after that, another note came that said the deal was off because the parents had goofed. And I assume by that it meant that they had contacted the authorities. Authorities took fingerprints from the notes, but at that time, they were only compared with the local database, and there weren't any matches um, that came up. Police had fielded complaints of someone trying to lure girls to phony babysitting jobs in the area, and I'm going to do more research into that to see if I can find any information. Um, but at this point, I haven't found too much about that other than, you know, that it was going on at the time of Margaret's disappearance. In 1985, a man came forward who said that he had th- kidnapped Margaret and thrown her body off a cliff in New York. Authorities, um, they investigated, they conducted a massive search of the area, and they found nothing. They later found out that this man had been in the hospital at the time that Margaret went missing, so he could not have been responsible. And in 1986, he was charged with giving false information to authorities. Four years later, authorities learned that there was a sex offender who had been living at Mount Holly and driving a red Volkswagen at the time of Margaret's disappearance. However, he was a ham radio operator and they found out that he was on a call at the time of Margaret's disappearance. And so he was rolled out as a suspect. When interviewed, Margaret's father, David, and said that the hardest times for him were early in the morning and then late at night. Those were the times when the house was quiet and his thoughts would drift to Margaret. And he you know, worried about where she was, if she was you know, still suffering, if she was in trouble. And just not knowing what had happened to her, you know, really tore him apart. And my heart does go out to him um, about that. It is very sad that both Margaret's father, David, and her mother, they both passed away without ever learning what happened to Margaret. There are still some of her brothers that are living, and, you know, they would like to give Margaret a proper burial, they would like to know what happened to her. We'll include here an age progression that shows what Margaret would look like years later. But again, I do not believe that she is still out there given the circumstances of this case. Given the circumstances of this case, I do believe that Margaret met with foul play. I don't believe that she is living um, any longer. Her family still has a $25,000 reward um, up for any information that leads to this case being solved. And I do hope that her body can be found so that she can have a proper burial. You know, everybody deserves that. And maybe when she is found, there will be some kind of evidence, um, DNA that can let us know what what happened to her and who might be responsible. Um, Even though at this point, there is a good possibility that the perpetrator um, would have probably possibly passed away because this was back in 1974. And there are many things that are suspicious in this case. We have the fact that the phone number 
the man called from was a phone booth, not an actual home phone number, and that the supermarket next to this phone book booth phone book phone booth had a manager whose name was Jack Marshall. So I'm thinking that the kidnapper gave the name John Marshall because it was similar to Jack Marshall and he probably figured that would lead authorities to think that this Jack Marsh Marshall was responsible. I don't think that the Jack Marshall actually had anything um, anything to do with it. You know, he checked out, took a polygraph, all that. Um, he was ruled out as a suspect. And I think it's probably right that he did not have anything um, to do to do with this case. I would like to do more research and I plan to do more research into the other phone calls the police had been um, investigating about the phony babysitting jobs to see what we can find out there. And also through my research, I came across several missing person and murder cases around the same area where Margaret Ellen Fox was from. The girls were of a similar age, either her age or a little bit older. And some of the circumstances are similar. Of course, they don't, they don't involve someone advertising babysitting position um, and giving a false name. Um, none of the cases I've come across yet um, have that same um, scenario, but there are other similarities. Um, so I will go through those now and you can let me know what you think. Maybe there was a serial killer operating um, at that time. And I do plan to do videos on some of those other girls that were missing and murdered within the same time frame so that we can explore a little bit more um, the similarities and see if there's, you know, any connection there. Candy, be quiet. The numerous girls, teenage girls, went missing within the few years surrounding the disappearance of Ellen Fox. I wanted to go through some of the disappearances and you know, show you some of the dates and also how close in proximity they were to Margaret. So we see Margaret Allen Fox, who we know is 14 years old. She disappeared on June 24th, 1974 and went missing from Mount Holly, New Jersey. Um, so you see it down here where Margaret was last seen in Mount Holly. About a 15 minute drive away is where Teresa was found she, where she'd been living uh, in Willingboro, New Jersey, again, only 15 minutes away. She was found murdered at 16 years old on July 24th, 1973. So almost exactly a year before Margaret's disappearance. Her cause of death was asphyxiation. There was a sandy-haired man, six foot two. 40 years old, wearing a light jacket and driving a red car in the vicinity of the victim's home. So they don't know for sure if it was this man. But what I do want to point out is that there was a red car. And in Margaret's case, the man said that he would pick her up in a red Volkswagen. Okay, so here in both of these cases, there is a red car. The other similarity I see here is the date. So we have July 24th, June 24th. If we're thinking a serial killer, maybe the dates has something to do, the number 24, I don't know. So let's look at the next um, case. We have Suzanne Garden. Now, Suzanne was found a bit further away. It's about an hour drive from where Margaret was last seen. But we don't, since we really don't know who committed this crime, we don't know where he came from, if he maybe lived in the middle and just sort of preyed on women, young girls in all this area. So Suzanne was 14 years old. She disappeared on January 27th, 1974. Not, not the 24th, um, like Margaret, but the 27th. So we're still in the 20s. She was found murdered, she was strangled, stabbed, and sexually assaulted. Again, the same age as Margaret. Very sad. 
There was another um, woman, young woman, named Cynthia Leslie, who was 18 years old, and she disappeared on February 24th, 1974, and was shortly after found murdered. She was strangled. There was, we don't know for sure if she was sexually assaulted or not. Um, she was found in Tom's River, the same place as the last girl, Suzanne. And notice the date. We have the 24th, a few months prior to Margaret's disappearance. So here we see where um, Teresa was the first girl was found in Willingboro. Margaret was last seen in Mount Holly. And Cynthia and Suzanne were both found in Tom's River. Next, we have Carolyn Majane. She was 15 years old. She went missing on August 22nd, 1975. So about a year after Margaret's disappearance, um, but the 22nd, not the 24th. She was missing from Morristown, New Jersey. And she was found close to where she went missing. And the cause of death was unknown because the skeletal remains were found in 1985. So it took 10 years for them to find her. And again, it's a 15-minute drive from where Margaret was last seen in Mount um, Holly to where Carolyn was found in Morristown. And you can see that it's not too far from where Teresa was found. Pretty crazy. And then we have Lorraine Ray Herbster who was 17 years old when she went missing in on March 9th, 1979. Okay, we're not in the 20s here, um, but she went missing from the same city as Margaret. And also, she has still not been found. Margaret and Lorraine, both missing from Mount Holly, then a five-year period, both are still missing to this day. Okay, so I just wanted to finally here go over a timeline to kind of put it into perspective. So if you drove Morristown, stopped in Willingboro, stopped in Mount Holly, stopped in Tom's River, that whole ride would be a total of 2 hours and 16 minutes. So our first case happened in July 24th, 1973. Teresa was murdered in Willingboro, New Jersey. The second case is when Suzanne went missing on January 27th, 1974. She went missing and was consequently found dead in Tom's River, New Jersey. Which, remember, that was about an hour away. On February 24th, 1974, Cynthia went missing and she was found dead also in Tom's River, New Jersey. Then on June 24th, 1974, Margaret Ellen Fox goes missing from Mount Holly, New Jersey. And on August 22nd, 1975, Caroline goes missing and she was found dead 10 years later, very close to here, in 1985. And then the final case was on March 9th, 1979, where Lorraine went missing, also from Mount Holly. And I don't know, what do you think? Do you think there's a connection here? Uh, the number 24, or there may be more cases that we haven't found yet that are connected? Is there a, Was there a serial killer? So what I'm going to do um, next is start, start looking at some of these cases, maybe we do another series depending on what information I find. Um, so I hope to see you in the next one. Bye, everybody.